interviewing the leading private equity executives and unlocking the secrets of success. Welcome to the Private Equity Podcast with Alex Rawlings. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Private Equity Podcast. Joining us today is Joe Coughlin, the CEO and founder of CRS Corporate Risk Solutions. Welcome, and thank you very much for sharing your insights with us, Joe. Great, Alex. Great to be with you. So as is customary on the podcast, please give us a 60 to 90 second breakdown of you, please. Sure. Well, Corporate Risk Solutions, uh, CRS, uh, is a independent risk advisory firm that was really initially founded back about 1985, uh, beginning of 1986. Uh, we are not an insurance broker. We are not an underwriter, but we are a risk advisor that works in what we call the alternative capital space, one in which we further define as private equity funds, hedge funds, distressed debt funds. Uh, we work in special situations uh, where we're doing turnarounds or bankruptcies and things of that nature. Today, we work with approximately 105 different funds that are scattered all over the world. Uh, most of those are private equity funds. Uh, we work with virtually every insurance broker that's relative in a space, and we work with every insurance carrier around the world. Uh, uh, I'd love to say we planned it, but uh, our client base has moved into every industry silo that's out there. So years ago, we, we took a left at Albuquerque and got involved in the energy space. We then followed that by the infrastructure space, bridges, tunnels, roads, airports, and ports. So we have some of the largest funds in the world on that as well. And then we work with you know, funds that are doing general investing, might be in real estate, could be in hospitality, could be in, it could be in telecom media, technology, retail, you name it. So it's, it's a very exciting, eclectic uh, group. And uh, with those 100 plus funds that we work with, we also act as outsourced risk advisors to several hundred portfolio companies that are within any one of those, those verticals or with any one of those fund silos. Uh, it, it's interesting, we, we started at a private equity fund where the key principal realized that there was no transparency that was coming in to their due diligence process. They were working with a broker and the broker was just basically selling them product at the end. And in those days, it was very easy to save, you know, 15 to 25% on every single deal. And then the broker was just going to maybe one or two different carriers. So we started that. And then in 1985, and then again, at the beginning of 86, we invented the first portfolio DNO program for a private equity fund. And then we invented the first portfolio property program. Law of large numbers. So you had rates that basically came down by as much as 45%. You had services that went up through the roof and you had leverage and aggregation. So that's, that's what we do every day. And, um, and we love it. Really appreciate that uh, that insight. So, having seen all sorts of different elements of private equity, what one mistake do you see private equity firms making, and what a actions would you suggest to correct them, please? Yeah, um, you know, I mean this as a compliment, but it's obviously a criticism. Uh, when you're working with private equity funds, just invariably you're working with some of the smartest people on the planet. They tend to be triple degreed. Um, certainly double degree, but there are you know, a lot of them tripled. They might have a PhD, they have a law degree on top of an MBA, and they're graduating from some very, very elite institutions, and they are smart, right? But sometimes when you're the smartest person in the room, you can also be the dumbest. Um, and they tend to treat our industry or the risk and insurance industry as a commodity. And they historically did that really up until about three years ago when the hardest insurance market in history has hit. And so they're not able to treat it as a commodity anymore. So they're finding out that they're, um, the way that they've approached it historically, uh, it, it was not the way to do it. So I found that, you know, there's a, a, a great story and, I, and I'll, I'll really rip through this, but it's, you know, Walt Disney was the most successful, you know, uh, uh, he was an entertainer, he was an animator, he was a, he, 
he had built a, a business that was a, a great franchise. But the highest paid, highest paid person in the industry as an entertainer was Art Linkletter. And Art and Walt uh, Disney were best friends. And uh, one day they were riding in a car, a convertible south of LA, and they're driving and it's about 110 degrees. And Walt Disney outlines exactly what he's gonna do when he's gonna build uh, Disney World. And he, they ride around for the, you know, about half a day in the sweltering heat. And they're driving back to LA and Walt says to Art, so Art, you, you're, you're my best friend. You're the most successful person in the world, in our industry, what do you think? And he said, Walt, whatever you do, don't do it. He said, why? He goes, why? He goes, one, there's no roads, there's no highways that go down, you know, into Anaheim. Uh, two, there's no airport that's anywhere near there. You got to fly into what was LAX, right? He said, three, the sweltering heat is enough to stifle. You'll never be able to do it. And uh, people will never come in, you know, off the coast. They'll never travel that far down south from LA. Well, rest is, you know, history. Disney World opened about 18 months later. That's how fast that was erected. And uh, 20 years to the date, he was riding in Florida again with Art Linkletter, his best friend, 20 years later. And he tells him he's just bought hundreds of thousands of acres, you know, near Orlando. And this is what he's going to do. This time it's Disney World. There's going to be Epcot Center. There's going to be this and such and such. They ride around for the day, comes back to the hotel and he says, what do you think? He goes, oh, no, no, no. I made a mistake that time, uh, last time. Biggest mistake of my life. I'm not doing that again. So the next morning, essentially, they meet for breakfast and he says, so what do you think? And he goes, well, I thought about it this time. And he goes, whatever you do, don't do it. <laughs> and he goes, why? Walt says, and he goes, why? He goes, first of all, people will never come in five miles off the coast of Florida, whether it's the West Coast or whether it's the East Coast. <clears throat> Secondly, there's no airport. There's no highway, right? This heat is sweltering. The mosquitoes are the size of condors. It rains every day at three o'clock. People will not do it. So the point was Art Linkletter who said, just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're good at another. So what we find is that the reason our firm gravitates very heavily towards operationally focused funds is that those people don't sus subscribe to what, you know, the Pauli principle where, you know, no two objects can exist at the same place at the same time. Well, that's not the same with ideas. You can have multiple I ideas and you can have multiple solutions at once. So when we hear a, 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 a person, you know, that tends to be a little, little cocky and a little arrogant, you know, thinking that they already have the answer, we kind of think of, um, well, I think of Nemesis and Nemesis is the daughter of Zeus, right? And she was there to punish hubris and arrogance. So I'm not wishing for schadenfreude that these people get, you know, demolished on a bad deal and they get spanked. I'm just saying that I just wish they would be a little bit more humble sometimes. That's the bad thing about, you know, uh, working with them. But the good thing is you're really working with very smart people and you learn a lot along the way. That makes sense. I appreciate the, uh, the analogy. I can't say we've had Walt Disney mentioned on the podcast as of, uh, as of yet. So I appreciate you uh, certainly sharing that with us. Um, so when you, obviously being in the risk space, when you assess a private equity firm's kind of own risk factors, what are the areas that you think that private equity firms tend to overlook or not consider as much as they should? Well, really, when it gets right down to it, what's protecting the private equity fund and its, its management you know, company is you know, from its day-to-day -day operations are the general partnership liability, which surrounds the firm or is intended to surround it. And that is, you know, protecting those people from going out and getting accused of, um, you know, either stealing a deal, tortious interference of some sort, some kind of anti-competitive practice. Uh, but in, in, in essence, there's a lot of litigation that, that revolves anytime you're going after and looking to acquire a company. You've probably, somebody's nose is out of joint someplace else. The employees management team, or competitors that have been looking at it for years and maybe thought that they had an inside track, but now somebody comes in the back door or the front door and, and now it's no longer their deal. So there's a lot of litigation that could take place. Uh, so it's absolutely key that the fund understand that and that they really take a, a, a very hard look at it. Uh, some funds uh, really do that and they do it religiously. And they, they kind of think about it, you know, at least several times a year as to where 
where they are at any given point in time. Because as you know, you know, a fund starts fund one, then there's a fund two. And, you know, we have some funds that are on, you know, you know, fund 16, you know, so that's, you know, been around a while. Those are the successful ones. Uh, normally you don't get past, you know, fund two or three if you're not, but uh, so that's, 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 that's key. And that's, that's critical. And you find that if they're really, really managing the fund itself, then they're very concerned about the acquisition that they're making and they care about the portfolio that they're buying. And they wanna have that same kind of oversight, that same kind of stewardship, because you know, once you buy the company, you know, the, the fire tends to start at the portfolio company and then it looks to spread beyond and go up into, into the, the fund itself. So we wanna to try to hermetically seal the risk at the portco, and then you wanna protect the fund at the highest level. In the event that something does get around that, then you want to have a you know a very good, very comprehensive, uh, and very transparent. Meaning, you need to be able to know that there's you know there's technically hundreds of firms, well there's thousands of insurance companies, right? But there's hundreds of uh, insurance companies that will will take this risk. Or there's MGAs, managing general agents, managing general underwriters that are out there and they're they're looking for these risks. Uh, but it it's, breaks down to probably then about 30, and then you have like 16, and then you have your probably your top eight that are on most funds in some way. And those are the ones that have been in the industry the longest and have stuck with it. Interesting. Interesting. I think risk, interesting subjects. It's one of those things, isn't it? Um, you know, you don't really consider it until someone causes a problem or, or yeah. an error occurs, and then suddenly you have a lot of focus. I can... Um, I can relate it to uh, burglary. Unfortunately, we've moved offices and uh, we've been targeted by burglars who basically stole um, cameras and all sorts of different audio equipment that we use for the recording oh, yeah. here. And suddenly I'm very interested in, uh, in office security, whereas previously I would have seen it as a waste. Um, we've now got cameras everywhere and watching them and obviously keeping anybody out. Um, but yeah, it's like anything with, with any of these things, isn't it? You don't really put enough appreciation to it unless obviously you're in your role the, until you absolutely need to. And then it's hindsight right. is a wonderful thing. Right. Necessity, the mother of invention, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Joe, what, are your, what is your perception on, you know, what, what three attributes you believe make up a top performer? Yeah, well, <laughs> we have a, a, a little bit of a debate here within uh, CRS and we're a small boutique. We have, uh, you know, 20 people. Um, I say speed is number one. Uh, some of my partners will quickly say, no, it's accuracy, right? And I go, yeah, but accuracy without speed is worthless. <laughs> so what, what we learned very early, again, back in 85, and especially working for this one very, very dynamic individual who was a real operator is when you move at the same speed as the private equity fund, uh, if not faster. Uh, the rest of the industry tends to work almost like in a kind of a, more of a commercial marketplace. And, and by the way, there's some very, very good brokers out there, but I'm saying by and large that if a client calls on a Friday evening or leaves a voicemail and says, hey, um, no rush on this. Um, as a matter of fact, you can get back to me next week or even the week after. But I just, I had this question. Uh, I have found that no one ever asks a question that they don't want an answer to. I just say that the answer is now. Uh, really what's happening is on Monday or Tuesday of the, of the following week, somebody's going to ask that person, um, hey, whatever happened with this thing that's related to this portfolio company or the general liability, the workers comp, the auto liability, the umbrella policy, the DNO, where, where do we stand on that? And the person's going to go, well, I called Coughlin last Friday and I, I left him a message and I told him to get back to me. That's the way it's going to get transcribed. So you know what? You're not, you're not ever going to catch us in, that, in that, that way. So they're calling Friday night, they're getting an answer Friday night and probably within minutes. And if not, then it's going to be Saturday morning or it's going to be Sunday. So that's the first thing. Uh, speed, let's just put a little little hyphen, you know, accuracy, because we're not going to give bad information. At worst, we're going to say, this is going to require a little bit more time. I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. And we will. Uh, the second thing is passion. Uh, I hope you hear it in my voice because, you know, I've been doing this for 42 years. Um, it, it, it's such a great spot. And it's because of the diversity and all the disparate assets that we work with. Um, 
so I think passion is is really uh, is a key thing. Uh, another would be just the curiosity. I I want to work with people that that want to know more about what's going on. I don't want to just know that somebody's putting rockets up in space. I want to know is it going into geo geosynchronistic orbit? Is it going into Mio Middle Earth orbit, or is it going into Leo? What's the use of it, the technology? Is it for parametric insurance products? Is it for weather? Is it just for communications? You know, I, I, I like to know where, where the future is going. I, I, the curiosity for me, I stay relevant. I know it's not a popular space to be in right now, but just personally, I do like crypto, right? I do like NFTs. I like, uh, there's a lot I, I don't like, and I don't think most of it will make it. I, as a matter of fact, almost very, very little of it will make it to the end, but it's, it's going to happen. It has to happen because of what's going on with fiat currencies and things. So I, I, those are the, those are three that I think are, are critical. And we're looking for those type of people as well. Yeah. I think anybody that, you know, that does any decision process, I think loves a bit of speed and loves a response quickly. And uh, even if it is, I'll oh, give me this in two weeks and it comes immediately. That's definitely an impression I like. Absolutely. Sorry to interrupt here. Just a quick note to highlight our new sponsor, Grata. The private equity market is rapidly shifting to a data-driven, proprietary deal sourcing standard. Grata provides the window into over 7 million middle market private companies. Contact Grata so you can access the market first. Request a demo at www.grata.com. Now back to the podcast. Well, you know, you... you... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you, you had a podcast with uh, Paul Doyle at uh, Blackford Capital. And I thought it was interesting. One, you know, he was a Notre Dame guy and I have a couple of kids that went to Notre Dame. But uh, I really thought that his, his references, I, I always live by metaphors and analogies because I never was that really great a student. But then after I graduated college, all of a sudden I, I realized that I know why I didn't have any because I went to a, a Catholic school and I was taught by 80 year old nuns. You know, and, and they didn't have much experience to give me, well, it's kind of like this or it's kind of like that. So I always try to take any subject matter and put it into, you know what, you know, telecom, media, such and such technology, it's kind of like this. And then you reference it into an example and somebody says, oh, I know what you're talking about. And then it's like, oh, wow. Well, you know how that? Yeah. So you're in a safe zone. Well, it's kind of here the same way. And all of a sudden it becomes, you know, becomes more natural. So with Paul, he was talking about, you know, being an athlete and some of the things, and I played a lot of sports and I was on teams. And, and what I found out over time was I realized I was a sprinter, right? I was a sprinter in track. I was a sprinter in, in swimming 50. Uh, I was dead after a 50 free, right? Don't even put me in a hundred. I'm not going to make it. Um, uh, but uh, you know, football, football is a series of plays, you know, blah, 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 blah. and so what private equity is for me and deal flow you know, you get a call and then you start, boom. And then you get right there up through close. And then there's a post close and things like that. You move to the next deal. It, you might be tired of that deal by the end it's done, but the new one that just comes in, it moves just as fast, just as quick, just as efficiently. So those are things that I, I thought was, it was interesting in the correlation. I'm always looking for a correlation. Well, yeah, and agree. Uh, Paul's Paul podcast was uh, was uh, was very impressive, and yeah, uh, seems like a great guy. Enjoyed that, and appreciate Jody being a being an av avid listener, uh, avid listener as well. So, Joe, looking at it from a you know from obviously your perspective, but also from you know servicing into the private equity industry with risk, what do you love about the private equity industry, and equally, what do you dislike? Well, I think. I'll start with what I dislike, which I kind of, um, I, I touched on, on that. Uh, that's, that's the first part was just, you know, sometimes the arrogance that, that, um, that comes with it, and, which is just disappointing. Um, and, and I, and what I don't like is when you start with someone who has um, very, very, uh, just, I don't want to say humble, but just a nice guy or woman and then all of a sudden hits some, some real nice successful strides. And then all of a sudden, um, maybe it's not all of a sudden, maybe it takes years, but is not the same person and their personalities change. And, and I think that's unfortunate. And, I, and I'm not, that's not limited to private equity. That could be anywhere, right? It's just that somebody correlates success with, um, 
and I've just seen so much of it. I, I think that that's why I, I, I bring it up. I, I just don't like that. I, I, I like to think I'm the same jerk <laughs> or a nice guy that I always was, right? I'm approachable. Uh, I'll talk to anybody about anything. Um, and it doesn't have to be about me. Uh, it could be uh, about anything. And, and, and you find other people, they don't have the time anymore. And it's not that they don't have the time. It's just that they're, they just feel as though that eh, it's just not important to me anymore. And I think they lose sight of that. So that's what I don't like. Um, uh, what I do like is, again, I like the speed because of the way uh, I'm kind of hardwired for. And I love, like, as I mentioned, I, I, I love working with smart people. Um, and I love the the eclectic nature of what we do. You know, we do work with a lot of VC firms. Well, I won't say a lot of VC firms. We work with some very successful VC firms that really care about their de minimis ownership, ownership stake that they have. So, and uh, there might be some hair on it uh, or there could be an IPO that's gonna be coming and things like that. So they really do need to care about it. But over time, you really see, you see that. And I love that when all of a sudden new deal comes in. It's like, what is that? And so we see things that are, you know, it could be ocean, you know, free ocean salmon, you know, farming that, that that's that's out there, or it could be, you know, manufacturing little leaf lettuce that are out there. And you see these, these facilities that are going up and you're getting into vertical farming and all the other types of nature. And then you're going to have zero gravity space farming that's coming down the road. I, that, that to me is, is, is just wild. And again, crypto, I knew nothing about blockchain and I knew nothing about you know, uh, just why there was ever a reason for doing it. But all of a sudden you take the correlation between one and gold and the reason why gold stood the test of time. Anyway, I, I, I can get going and pontificate for too long, but that's, those are the things I love. I love the fact that people are looking for things and they're looking to make them better and, um, you know, hopefully, you know, make some money along the way. Yeah, there's some phenomenal, phenomenal products, services, Things I can't even comprehend coming through, certainly on the venture side, and even some of the well, you, firms you see it, yeah. Ideas, and I'm like, God, why hasn't you know why why hasn't this been around forever? Um, so uh, their their investments and uh, and areas that they're obviously pushing, and especially some of the growth equity firms. So yeah, I bet especially in risk, and, and so I suppose some of these things can be difficult to to look at risk and elements of uh, of that when it's really new technology. Does that make it complex? Say the last part again. Sorry, when you're looking at obviously with the when they're bringing in all these new portfolio companies and some of them have such diverse areas, is there a complexity when you're looking at from a risk aspect of their investments and in areas like that? Oh yeah, very much so. Um, and as everybody who could be watching or listening to this podcast right right now knows, you know, cyber has just you know, I don't want to say taken the world by storm, but it's taking. The world by uh, storm. Uh, the, it, the hard market that we're in today started almost exactly three years ago. And the average hard market that's gone, you know, over time, you know, I think it was um, 73 to 76, and then it was 81 to 84, and then it was 2001, 2003 ish. This market, though, is just absolutely systemic across the board. Certain types of hard markets affect you know, property pricing or bonding, you know, surety and things like that, that are out there, maybe some umbrella limits. This take took in the entire, and it, it had a lag on, on cyber, which we were really shocked at, which took about a year more. So it's really only two years into a, a hard market for the, for the cyber side. I was, I'm still am amazed at why it didn't hit because, you know, there's cyber occurrences that are taking place every 11 seconds. And, you know, billions and billions of dollars are being spent, ransomware and all these types of things. But, you know, people, when they look at this hard market, they have to realize that this was, if that movie with George Clooney, you know, the perfect storm, um, you know, where that three storms came in off of Massachusetts at the same time, made a movie out of it, whatever. This was a, a perfect storm, which was about eight different correlations of things. It was the highest amount of hydrological and climatolog climatological uh, claims. It is... Uh, it is GDPR, it is the CCP, California Con Con Consumer Protection Act, and the regulatory requirements there. It is BLM, 
you know, that took place with all the riots and things like that. It's the Me Too movement, which saw some 400 C-suite executives, you know, removed from office and then the ensuing litigation. It's the Scion decision, which some brilliant people, you know, a judge said, oh, no, you, you don't sue for uh, SEC related uh, cases anymore in federal court with skilled judges and a judiciary to oversee it. You now can sue in state court as well. So you're burning the limit twice as fast. Then you take, uh, you know, an ESG, you put that in there, uh, which all the ensuing things that are coming out of that and DNI, diversity, and inclusion. And you, then you take the lowest interest rates in history. Um, in history, 5,000 years, you know, when you, you go back, you'd have to go back to the Egyptians, you know, uh, to, to find it, you know, well, you, you wouldn't find it. And then on top of all of that, what do you have? You know, because remember, insurance companies, when they're collecting a premium dollar, they're going to pay that out either that year or maybe five years out, maybe 10 years out from now. So where do they put that money to invest it? Well, they don't go into high yield instruments like private equity, you know, or mezzanine, you know, debt and things like that. They put it into really low interest rates, which are very secure. So what are they getting? Two percent. So that book of business with those interest rates went down. Now it's starting to go back up because interest rates are going and people are, you know, the insurance companies are readjusting their bond portfolios. And so they're getting their, uh, you know, they're getting a reset right now that that's happening. So, but on top of everything that I just mentioned, then you put COVID on top of it, right? And so that's what's going on in the industry. And, you know, our job, sometimes it, it, we like to say, you know, we love to save clients, you know, on everything that we touch. I used to say we had at least a 10 X multiple, you know, on ROI, you spend a hundred thousand, we're going to find you, you know, a million. Um, sometimes it's, you know, hundreds of times that. Uh, sometimes it's infinity because we don't charge a penny and we save tens of millions of dollars. Um, and it, that's how, how quick it can be. Uh, but I think that uh, the industry right now is um, it's, it's more about mitigating, mitigating price increases and, and cyber, it's still going to take a while there. And they're really diving down deeply now into a firm as to, you know, where the exposure may lie. And it's, um, it's it's not a pretty picture. There's a lot of depth there, Joe, and there's a lot to worry about. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's why uh, people like yourself are around uh, to support us during that. So yes. it sounds like pretty, pre well, I guess pretty well read, obviously references to your analogies and everything else that you've mentioned. What are your kind of influences? What do you read? What do you watch? What do you kind of listen to and, and consume, Joe? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, what I read, uh, and it's, it amazes me that some people think this is controversial, but I read, you know, I always pronounce it Anne, but I know it's Ayn Rand. So I'm a big proponent of, you know, two of her books, you know, which are The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Um, and both of those books um, really mirror what we're seeing today. It's, it's hard to understand what's going on in, in the world, never mind the United States in the last, you know, few years. Um, and, it, and it's 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 scary. But, it, you know, you'd see the reason it was so prescient when she wrote these, you know, as early as I think 1948 was that she had come from Russia and she saw what um, what communism could do and how people could, you know, take things and that they could reallocate, you know, things um, that it, let's face it, the government doesn't produce anything that it hasn't taken from somebody else. Right. So uh, that part. Uh, those are those are two books, and I'm I'm very big on individualism, not like oh it's about me, it's mine, you know, let me keep it and things like that. I'm just saying responsibility. So I'm a big you know uh, advocate of uh, personal responsibility. The other books I like as it relates to like business that that really helped me uh, would be Jim Collins, Good to Great, right? It's and, and more importantly, it's getting you know that. You know, uh, anybody could read the cliff notes and, and come away with this, but, you know, getting the right people onto the bus in the right seats. And, and just to realize that you, you don't just want to throw the person off, uh, which maybe, maybe you really do, but you know that they're very talented and you must see this, Alex, a lot, right? Uh, but you do want to say, I, I got I to gotta move that person either the back of the bus or the front of the bus, but they can't be in the middle <laughs> with everybody else right now. So that, that's a big one. And then the thing that I mentioned, you know, after, you know, I graduated college 
is, uh, it, and it made sense much many years many years later was I was reading Malcolm Gladwell and and I think Malcolm has gotten a little repetitive I'm very opinionated but I think on the tipping point where he one of the big takeaways was that there's three kind of people that are out there and you got salesmen you've got mavens and you have connectors and I guess I'm a little bit of of everything I, I won't give my credit for being a maven because I'm you know I could be seen by many as just like a jack of all trades uh but I do love connecting dots and I have connected a lot. And I really, that is so satisfying for me because there's, there's no quid pro quo that's ever involved. I'm not looking for anything. It's just normally trying to take a nice person over here and introduce it to a friend over here, that type of thing. And so the connector part, and I, and I am a salesman, right? I mean, I love, I love selling. And um, so, so those are, those are books that, uh, that really resonated uh, with me. And then la lastly, there's one um, which is financial in nature. And it, I really highly recommend this to anybody who's listening to this podcast. It was, I don't know when it came out, but it's probably 25 years ago now. Uh, but Against the Gods by Bernstein. And it's really man's understanding, first understanding of risk. You know, and it, that goes back to the Egyptians and it, it goes back into dice and marbles and chances of probability. And then it goes into Fibonacci, you know, the Italian mathematician and things like that quantitative analysis and things, but a lot of very good stories, but it really gets, gets right to the heart of you and me as to why we do certain things. And when we, you go to Las Vegas and I, I don't like to gamble on anything except on the golf course, you know, with me, because it's my responsibility and I will affect the outcome. No one else can, uh, but it, you lose a hundred dollars, you lose a thousand dollars. And what, what do you do? Do you get your hand spanked and you leave and go away from the table or do you double down, right? What makes a person double down and all that. So I, that book is fantastic for understanding like the mentality as to really what's going on the psychology. I've not heard of, uh, heard of that one. I'll certainly have to, have to check it out. I mean, yeah, good to great Jim Collins, uh, obviously quite the, uh, quite the classic, um, um, but you know, the fundamentals are right. And I, I completely agree with your statement. I mean, obviously yeah. I would, but I don't think there's an individual, certainly in the private equity world, that would argue you can have the wrong person in the right, uh, in sorry, wrong person in, in the business leading it, either as an investor, uh, investment professional, back office professional, or obviously portfolio executive, and for that business to, to come off uh, particularly well on an exit process if, uh, uh, if, if the wrong people are serving it. So 100% agree that that has to be... Uh, uh, has to be a main point for any business to to get the right people in. And I know I've said this quote before, and I, I will, I do need to research who said it, but um, uh, what's it? 90% of business problems are talent problems, uh, certainly in disguise. So um, absolutely. So, so Joe, if uh, anybody wants to reach out to you, uh, obviously have a, a further, further dialogue, how bets do they get in touch, please? Uh, best way is, uh, you know, our website, you know, which is, you know, World Wide Web uh, uh, at uh, CRS, uh, CRS Limited, spelled out, dot com. And, um, and then we're in the book, we're, we're anywhere. Uh, and we love, we just love uh, blue skying things. You know, sometimes it's not the right, right time to do anything. Uh, and sometimes it is, and people just don't know it. But it's just fun to talk about business platforms and exploring ideas. And I, I think that, you know, our references are second to none which means that um, a lot of times people confide in us with a lot of information. Um, and that trust that, uh, that they've given us has never been misplaced. So we, we're, we're looking to, to, to find clients and customers, but we're, I know it sounds corny, but we're looking to make friendships uh, that, that extend and, and, and they can you know, coexist. And you don't wanna disappoint a friend, um, so we don't. So, you know, definitely agree with that. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us, Joe. Really appreciate your insight. Leave lots of value and lots of varied discussions, actually, not just uh, just the exciting uh, topic of, uh, of risk, uh, but definitely gave us lots to, uh, lots to think about there. So, so thank you very much for, for all of your insight today. Hey, thank you, Alex. Really appreciate it. Look forward to more of your podcast. Oh, that's very kind of you to, to say, uh, Joe. And as always, thank you very much for joining us, uh, for everybody listening today. And of course, should you ever need support with either private equity professionals or portfolio executive hiring across Europe and North America, then please do reach out to me at Raw Selection. But to the next time, 
keep smashing it and thank you very much for listening thank you for listening to the private equity podcast on www.raw-selection.com 